You're listening to Go with Jamarlin Martin. We have a go hard or go home approach as we talk to the leading tech leaders, politicians, and influencers. This is part two of the interview. Let's go. So I want to bring up something. You're a feminist, black feminist. Uh, you're very active and vocal uh, in terms of black women. And there's a term that's out there, hotep, mm-hmm. or hotepism. And, you know, sometimes there's kind of conversations or discussions where people are going back and forth. What steps do we need to take in terms of this generation where we got a beast to fight with in terms of the the big scheme of things? You know, how do we pull ourselves together uh, in terms of unity where we're not going back and forth and we're trying to learn from each other where the, the black man, he's not coming with the ego, but he wants to understand where you're coming from. Why you have to bang so hard for feminism? Is there a path for, you know, different parts of the community to kind of better understand each other where, hey, we're banging against kind of bigger forces and the brothers uh, on, I guess, uh, what what people are calling the hotel side, they have a better understanding of the black woman's double plight in the United States. Yeah, I, I- I don't think that we'll ever be able to really uh, address the bigger issues, you know, quote unquote, or the the issues that impacts all groups of black people until we deal with some of our internal stuff, you know, and the internal beefs and battles that we have, you know, uh, men and women, uh, straight people and queer people, cis people and trans people, you know, class mobile people and poor people so much of the tension and hatred and and misunderstanding of one another that we have is a result of the, you know, the oppression that we all face at the hands of white supremacy. Um, You know, I'll say that as somebody who's an out and proud feminist, it's painful um, to read some of the things or hear some of the things that black men have said to and about me um, and other women like myself. Uh, I'm not a fan of the term hotep. I don't use it. You know, I may have used it a few times early on when it in its inception, but I, I never really felt comfortable with it. I just would rather not use, um, you know, something that is a beautiful and significant wor- word to people uh, across the world to describe something as ugly as what the people who've gotten that moniker do and, and represent in so many ways online. Yeah, this generation, you know, when I see people uh, using hotep in a derogatory uh, way, I wonder... Do they even know who the real Hotep is? Have they read? They do. Anthony Browder, the Nile Valley. They do. Uh, they do. And I, and I think that one, not all of them, of course, they use it. But, you know, knowing where the word kind of started from in terms of his social media usage and all. Like, the difference between, I'd say, the, the kind of loudest black feminists um, or kind of more most prominent ones, I should say, uh, of this moment versus the people that get, you know, that term used toward them is that. Most of us, before we were feminists, were black nationalists, you know, and, and many of us still are, right? Or, or our foundation, our understanding of oppression begins with race, you know, but we also learn to recognize and understand the ways that we are targeted and abused um, by our own and, and by the forces of white supremacy on the basis of our gender and what that looks like for LGBT people, et cetera. And on the other side, you have this male led way of thinking, which is that one race is the bigger issue. We need to deal with that and everything else will just call kind of fall into play or into place rather, which is essentially trickle down uh, liberation. And, you know, as we know, trickle down, yeah. anything doesn't really work. Um, and two, this, this notion that if black women occupy a better station in the world or in our communities than we do now that we're taking something away from our men, you know, that the LGBT rights and equality movement is taking something away from black people or from straight black men. And that's simply not true, you know? Um, And, you know, I, I know it's hard for us to do the dance between we don't want to respond to issues of racism with what about black on black crime? You know, like we know that black on black crime exists because most crime is intra, it's an interracial exchange, right? A white guy gets robbed by a white guy, a white woman gets raped by a white guy more often than not. But when we talk about domestic violence, we talk about sexism, when we talk about not 
you know, a, a number of men not being able to recognize or support the humanity, the challenges faced by, um, you know, the significance of black women, that that decimates us in certain ways that we have to confront. And yeah. so confronting, you know, when we talk about patriarchy and sexism, yes, we're, we're typically talking about all men, right? Right, where we're talking about the male species. But when we talk about what it looks like in terms of our community, black men are the ones that we most often partner with, who we live among, who we're hired by, who we, you know, are harassed or abused by, who we love, who, you know, we've been let down by, who we've been brought up by. Like or this, assaulted this, by. Or assaulted yeah. by. And to not be able to talk about those things without being accused of being complete, uh, complicit or, or working, you know, gleefully with white supremacy is unfortunate. Like, Yeah, it sounds like, you know, although unity... Uh, be, between some of the segments of the community, uh, it sounds like, hey, we need to come together. We need to create a path for understanding. But from my perspective, I see brothers out there, they're not trying to give up oppressing women. Right. Meaning that they've been taught this. They think that that's part of being a man, oppressing yeah. women, abusing women. And anything that takes away from that they feel insecure and fragile. And, and that's a, uh, a big group where, hey, you know, part of the black identity is you need to oppress the woman. Yeah. In, very, in, in, in various degrees. So would you say that you're not optimistic that we're going to make strides in, in, in terms of kind of reconciling these, uh, Actually, these issues? You know, am I optimistic that I'll see it? you know, all the way through in my lifetime? No, but but I think that there are changes and things happening. Um, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm on the older half of the millennial uh, generation. When I think about my exchanges, you know, in social settings, excuse me, professionally, romantically, um, my relationships to and with uh, black men of my, you know, generation and some of the younger black, you know, men and boys that I've come across, uh, I see far more and even some of the extras too you know um i see more progressive attitudes around gender and sexuality than i think we've experienced in previous generations and part of it is you know so many of us are spending our days online having these you know back and forth dialogues we're getting access to perspectives and information that certainly existed before, but were hidden. Um, you know, they weren't easily accessed, right? Or you had to go pick up a, a Bell Hooks book to know what Bell Hooks stood for and, and, you know, the sort of things that she was talking about. And I, I don't want for people's education or understanding or exploration of, of gender and sexuality and power to begin and end with the internet. But I, I think it's a great place to start, you know, and it's yep. a gateway to a lot of that information. Um, and I just, you know, in addition to what you were saying, for a lot of our men, I think there's this idea that, or this understanding that the only places where they can experience power, true power or dominance, um, is on the backs of women, you know? And so, uh, if you take that away, then what part of manhood, you know, do I occupy? Um, where do I fit into this, uh, this notion of what masculinity is supposed to be? Uh, you know, I get beat up at work. Uh, I get beat down in the world. Uh, I won't earn as much as my white male peers. They started on, you know, a whole different place than me. And, you know, they're, they're so much further ahead than I am. But here's this one place where I can punch down. You know, uh, there was a conversation, a small clip of it went viral not too long ago between a very young Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin. You know, and she says, you know how white folks think about you. You know what your boss says of you and how he treats you. And you smile. You know, you take that on the note. You, you, you smile to survive it. And you come home to me and I catch hell. And it gave me chills, you know. Uh, she said, I get the least of you because I love you. And that's super real for some of our, you know, for so many of our experiences. And, you know, I say things like that, you know, there are folks that assume that I've only had, you know, that I don't have an active father or that my child doesn't have an active father and that all my relationships with men have been unhealthy. And it's quite the opposite. You know, I have yeah. a great relationship with, with both of those men and overwhelmingly have had good. In terms of some folks, they'll try to 
put you in a box of you hate men. Yeah, yeah. You, I hate yeah. men because either my dad abandoned me or wasn't there for me yeah. or my ex abandoned me or wasn't there for me. And that's not true. And, and the majority of my romantic uh, relationships have been healthy and positive, you yeah. know. Um, but there's still the world around me, you know, and, and that, that doesn't just because those relationships have been positive doesn't always mean that some of my other interactions um, and experiences with men haven't been positive. And then there's, you know, what I'm able to observe. There's what we're seeing statistically that says we've got some work to do on healing. And until we really are willing to do that work, there's going to be, you know, continued suffering and strife between us. You worked on the uh, Cynthia Nixon campaign how did that come about? Uh, where you were able to get a major role in the uh, New York governor race? I uh, I wouldn't say I had a major role, but it, you yeah. know it, it was a special role. Um, a, a dear friend of mine, El Joy Williams, who is a political strategist, uh, radio host, and uh, president of the local of the Brooklyn NAACP chapter, just a, a phenomenal uh, pillar of the community was brought in as a senior advisor and she'd invited me uh prior to her formally starting her role she'd brought me into an event or maybe it's right when she started an event where she'd got uh, a number of black activists and media people and you know education advocates in a room to meet cynthia and her wife christine and just listen uh to what they you know wanted to offer the state of New York and also for them to kind of hear um, from people in our spaces uh, what we were looking for from, you know, our next governor. And around that time, I, I left my nine to five and I had said, I'm getting into consulting. I'm not going to have any more bosses. I'm going to have a couple clients and I'm going to focus on my writing. And uh, Eljoy said, would you want to come in and do communication strategy uh, for us? And it was a great experience. Uh, Cynthia and her family are it's really awesome people. And I think she had a, a wonderful vision for New York. Um, parts of it have been adopted by Andrew Cuomo, who was, yeah, of course, he, the incumbent. Yeah. And, you know, he spent $22 million and we spent two. And he was uh, fumbling trying to go over to the Nixon side. He said uh, America was never great. He, you know, he's trying to be more progressive. Mm -hmm. And that's why when these progressive candidates run, they may lose, but they force the corporate yep. Democrats to come a little bit more correct. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we pushed him to the left. And, you know, honestly, I, I believe that really was the uh, the campaign. The campaign was successful, even though we did not win. You know, yeah. um, we knew that we were the underdog. Uh, no one wanted to go up against not just uh, the incumbent, but like. Cuomo is a brand name. He's an inst you know, his family, family is an institution yeah. in New York State. But someone had to push him to the left. And Cynthia, you know, who'd been active in in uh, activism, uh, particularly around education and inequality in New York for some time, you know, was convinced to to go out there and be in certain ways a sacrificial lamb. And, you know, here we are with the governor saying that he's going to legalize marijuana within the first hundred days of his uh, term, that he's, um, you know, he's taken serious steps around the black maternal health crisis in New York state. And, you know, speak, he's still doing that dance. You know, he, he is still governor Andrew Cuomo in so many ways, but while folks were covering a celebrity being in the campaign, you know, which was fascinating and interesting. And I wish that they'd covered more of the policy uh, work that she'd put forward because it was incredibly progressive and, and would have transformed uh, schools and institutions in ways that would have certainly benefited uh, black New Yorkers in, in very meaningful ways, uh, largely because black hands helped to shape, you know, this agenda. But while people were paying attention to the idea that Miranda from Sex and the City is in the governor's race, and that's interesting, what they weren't paying attention to were those down ballot races, you know, and look at who's one of the most uh, talked about women in politics right now, Ocasio-Cortez, yeah. you know, and she didn't get covered from the New York Times until the election was almost over, you know, rather until the uh, uh, campaign was almost over. And had there been more focus on those down ballot races, um, some of those progressive candidates that won, including Ocasio-Cortez, would not 
I, I don't think they would have made it because the local Democratic Party invested their resources into getting Cuomo reelected as yeah. opposed to protecting the centrist Democrats um, and other parts of uh, state government uh, that were unseated as a result. That's an interesting point of view where he had to play so much defense that opened up a lane for folks like Ocasio-Cortez. How do you respond to this statement? Things are more nuanced for black America now. They're more complex. In the future, based on the structure of things, in many cases, voting white is the real voting black. When the black candidate, particularly a black candidate who's part of the corporate establishment, Traditionally, going back to Jesse Jackson and Hope, and of course we saw Obama with Hope, we want to vote black. When we see someone who looked like us, and that goes back to a lot of our grandparents who watch a basketball game, there's more black people on that team. I'm, I'm banging that. with that team. But in terms of the structure of things, and it's not as simple as that anymore, that in the future... Uh, And now I believe that you're going to see where the real progressive black folks, they are not voting for the black candidate. Voting for the black candidate is the white position in terms of your options as it relates to the black community. How how would you respond to that in terms of, hey, there's going to be cases where voting white is the real voting black for this particular election. Yeah, Um, you know, and that's that has happened in local elections before um, with mixed results. It's it's going to be difficult. You know, I think it's something that millennials and digital savvy Xers may do better with than, say, baby boomers. You know, people that are consistently consuming information about who these people are and why, you know, in this race, the white candidate better represents your interest than... Uh, the black candidate. Historically, there have been times where we chose the black, you know, the white male candidate over the black female candidate, you know, uh, with relative ease. But when you have, you know, a a charismatic, likable black guy or a woman um, who is more centrist than someone else uh, that better represents our views, I, I hope that we're in a place now where we're able to identify that in either pushing the black candidate, you know, and, and saying, this is what we need and want. Are you willing to deliver that? Or simply saying, you don't deserve our vote. You know, we've rejected a number of black Republican candidates over the years. It's one thing that, you know, I mean, thank goodness for the racism of the GOP. <laughs> you know, um, I think that in some of the ways that our communities uh, can be conservative socially, that if the Republican Party weren't so deeply committed to its racism that we might have, you know, seen uh, black Republican candidates go further, you know? Yeah. What would you say that structurally, the corporate Democrat, the ones who the lobbyists love, uh, the ones who have conflicted relationships with a lot of corporations, elites, they can offer us less if there's a black candidate or a black woman candidate because we're so happy with whether it's race or gender in terms of that emotional connection that you're not used to seeing this, that that's, we take that as value, but it's a symbolic value where if you give them black or you give them woman, we don't have to move on these structural issues. We, you know, we don't have to move as much as if we don't offer this, uh, some of this feel good stuff. You know, that's interesting. I don't. That sounds far fetched. I'll say that. Well, I'll say this. I think, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, but yeah. I, I think that considering that we've already had a black president, you know, the, the idea of that is, re, you know, the idea of returning to that after having white nationalist president is certainly an ex, you know a, a compelling proposition but that there will be more scrutiny over who that black president 
you know, that next black president might be um, due to, I think, some of the disappointments of the Obama administration in relation specifically to what you talked about uh, earlier with Michelle, uh, Mrs. Obama talking about Reverend Wright and how her husband also distanced himself from that. Um, you know, that we're not going to, in an era after or during Black Lives Matter, all the things that we've seen in recent years with MAGA being a factor and racism becoming so much less, uh, so much more unapologetic than it, yeah. you know, even had been in the, you know, 80s or 90s, that just him simply having a black person is not going to dazzle us in the way that it once did. And it may happen, you know, on a smaller race, uh, in terms of a smaller race, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that a centrist black candidate, you know, you'd have to have that same recipe that President Obama had, you know, like centrist in many ways, but also speaking to this idea of hope and change, having this beautiful family, having this wife that was relatable and so much a, a black girl's black girl um, and, and so familiar to so many people. And right now we, we do have two black people that are interested in um, taking that office and neither of them really represent those things. So I think that we will do um, a, a better job of kind of judging Scrut them based on who they yeah. are, you know, what they uh, are, are saying, what they have done in the past and, and what they intend to do than just being dazzled by them being black. Do you have a favorite in the race so far? I do not. And what do you think about, hey, the way the politics game works what the people are going to say from here or even they know they're going to run the last two years us in the community we need to discount what they're going to say now we need to be looking at track records in terms of going back 10 years to get insight into your their values and principles and who did they bang against did they make the tough decisions on behalf of the weak and vulnerable that that's the the history stuff is way more important than what all the millions of dollars of campaign dollars and consultants what are they going to cook up for us now are you leaning towards anyone i'm not you You're know not. right okay. now i'm really just focused on learning more about who these people are who they have been and what they you know have to offer uh the united states i think you know um Obviously, no one in that race has had a, you know, it's the highest office in the land. So nobody's been president before. No one's done work that was parallel to it. Um, you know, Booker and Harris have not been in the Senate terribly long. You know, they're, so it's, they've got resumes. They have long um, work histories in, in terms of politics. But since each of them uh, first were elected to any office, the world has changed. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton's approach to mass incarceration was very different, or I should say to crime and punishment, was certainly different than candidate Bill Clinton. You know, um, the world, you know, people's attitudes and opinions and thoughts have changed. Back then, it was lock up as many of the bad guys as you possibly can and make this place safer. And a whole lot of black activists and clergy members co-signing you know, really awful legislation um, that led to a mass incarceration crisis, you know, and as a candidate, she had to confront that and say, I agree with you and I, I'm willing to tear these structures down, whether was she would have done it or not, you know, we won't know. Um, but I think that those two candidates will have to answer to the ways that they participated in um, or, or upheld things either socially or um, in terms of legislation that were not in the best interest of black folks and you know where are they willing to distance themselves from their own past and say i've changed uh you know i have a different vision of what we need and here's how i'll deliver on that all right i want to thank you for uh coming on the show although you have hundreds of thousands of uh followers online for the audience who are not familiar with you where can they check you out online my website is jamilalemieux.com. Um, my Twitter and Instagram handles are at Jamila Lemieux, J-A-M-I-L-A-H-L-E-M-I-E-U-X. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Let's go. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Go. You could check me out at Jamarla Martin on Twitter and also come check us out at moguldom.com. That's M-O-G-U-L-D-O-M.com. Be sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter. You can get the latest information on crypto, tech, economic empowerment, and politics. Let's go.